Well, welcome back to Wall Street Silver. We have some amazing guests today to talk about possibly credit issues with Wells Fargo making a very surprise announcement today. I'd like to welcome Mr. David Morgan from the Morgan Report. I'd like to welcome Travis, the economic ninja, and uh, also Lee Justo from the Wall Street Silver community. Thanks for joining me, guys. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Jim. So let's get right into it. Mr. Travis, you uh, have been all over the story. Why don't you update our audience on what's going on with Wells Fargo? This is the Zero Hedge article that came out today. What can you tell us about what's going on with Wells Fargo, Travis? Yeah, so I got this, uh, I was actually on the treadmill, saw this come across because one of my amazing subscribers sent it to me uh, and jumped off the treadmill, knew exactly what this was. Um, ironically, and even if, though I explained that uh, Wells Fargo is shutting off uh, existing personal lines of credit, not a lot of people understood what that meant. Uh, there are actually a lot of people that were asking great questions. Uh, I'm actually going to do a follow-up video tomorrow about, uh, well, wait, I have a Wells Fargo bank account. Is this affecting me? Or I have a Wells Fargo credit card. Does this affect me? And um, even though this isn't exactly how it rolled out in 2008, it does show there's some very serious and striking similarities. See, this is a, uh, a personal line of credit. A lot of people uh, use them for um, you know, making it month to month, just in case, a, a monthly budget buffer. Also, a lot of people that run small businesses in our country use these uh, to get them between uh, invoices. You know, They become their own invoice factoring company, essentially, because quite frankly, uh, business lines of credit are harder to get. They have higher rates, different terms. So this isn't just using uh, you know, for personal use. And so uh, there's a lot of good questions uh, stemming from what this means. And uh, this uh, brings me back in time to uh, prior to the Lehman Brothers uh, shutdown when they started uh, closing off, shutting down uh, lines of HELOCs, uh, home equity lines of credit. Uh, back then, that was a big deal because homes were falling in value prior to the Lehman collapse. And so uh, banks were hedging themselves. They were preparing. Uh, so they were uh, sealing off those uh, lines of credit that were tied to homes and real property. Here we see uh, personal lines of credit that are not tied to any type of um, uh, you know, asset. And they're starting to close off these too. However, I want people to know this, and sorry, it's a little long-winded. You know, this isn't the first uh, sign of this. Uh, Wells Fargo has tightened their auto uh, loan line. They did this, uh, I believe it was almost a year ago. JP Morgan also started to shut down how many um, mortgages it put out because it was seeing things way ahead of time. I believe they did that about eight months ago, if memory serves me right. And so what's happening is you're starting to see a very serious pattern of a bank's understanding where we are in the cycle. This isn't anything that's new. Economic cycles uh, are always here. They always, uh, we always move in and out of them. And uh, this is a great yet one more uh, nail in the coffin to what is coming here, probably what I believe pretty soon. Uh, Mr. Morgan, what's your take on all this? Well, I'd like to just uh, verify with the economic ninja. Uh, we used to refer to them when I was much, much younger as a signature loan. In other words, you could, at that time, I was in the credit union for a corporate job. And based on your credit rating, you were able to just basically get a signature loan. And at that time, I think it was 2,500. I remember using that credit line. And of course, people could say, oh, David, you're making it up. It's not, it's true. I used that 2,500 and bought gold at 300 an ounce. But uh, so I think he did a great job explaining it. What does it mean? I'll have to refer to it. And you know, he's not online, but Bill Holter is probably one of the ones that have talked about the credit contraction and what it means. Everything's based on credit. When you have the credit freeze or let's say this type of uh, situation, it is going to devastate the market. Or let me rephrase that. It could devastate the markets. This is just a precursor beginning. It's Wells Fargo. It's huge. Uh, they do a lot of mortgages. They do a lot of credit. It's halted. They did it, I think, in 2020 for a brief time last summer. So as Travis said, it's not just, you know, all of a sudden it's never happened before. Nonetheless, I think it is an early warning signal. I'll leave it there. Well, you know, I, I'm actually a customer of Wells Fargo, and I actually have one of those personal lines of credit with Wells Fargo, I have a $25,000 line of credit, 
and I use mine exactly the way Travis just described um, so that I don't have to, I, you know, I, I keep less cash in my accounts and I basically use that for uh, cash flow management purposes uh, just for short term hits and then pay it off uh, right away when I don't need it. And I just checked mine after this news broke and my account's still active and still available, but I, it looks like within the next 30 to 60 days, it's going to be shut down. So, and, you know, we'll see what happens. I'll stay on top of it. Uh, what do you think, Lee? Well, you know, it's interesting what Travis said. Um, I'm going to share. This is a typical scene in New York City these days. You have so many retail businesses boarded up, restaurants and things like that. All kind of a, a hangover from COVID, but it, it, it started happening before that, you know, the, the retail apocalypse. And you just imagine how many business owners, I mean, a lot of these are just small restaurants, middle class owned, probably relying on credit lines like this. And they're just, they're just gone. So, you know, you got to wonder what data Wells Fargo is looking at on a macro level that made them uh, make this decision after all this uh, over a year. Travis, you wanted to say something? So one thing I want to touch on is invoice factoring and what you said, Jim, as far as how you use your uh, uh, credit line. Invoice factoring is something that's sort of dark. People don't really talk about it, but it's how the banks make most of their money worldwide. And what they do is they're essentially a credit facility for, for um, like an intermediary between a business and who it's charging for its goods and services. And uh, it's a facility that uh, is constantly moving back and forth uh, these short-term loans to keep businesses solvent because, uh, you know, depending on how long out, how far out their invoices are, it could actually make them or break them. So a lot of small businesses in our country, quite frankly, use this facility um, to be able to do it cheaply and efficiently. Because like I said, business loans or business lines of credit are totally different terms than a personal. Um, now, like we said, this isn't the end. This isn't something, it's, it's a big deal because what I think you're see, gonna see is smaller shockwaves. Uh, this is gonna send out into uh, the banking industry is what's gonna uh, uh, just guaranteed what's gonna happen is a lot of people are gonna go, they don't see these YouTube videos put, being put out by uh, you know all of us right now. And um, they're gonna get caught. Like I told, I said in my video, uh, the person that was very angry with me that day when I got up and left lunch, ran down and wrote that check. Mm -hmm to ensure that I still had that money. I still had that credit, even though it was in another bank account and I'm immediately now paying monthly payments on that. In having that available cash for an emergency or a downturn was more important to me. Well, the facts are a lot of people are about to run out, find out that they don't have that credit. They're going to go to another bank. And I believe you're going to start seeing uh, massive amounts of uh, applications for new personal lines of credit with let's say JP Morgan, um, Bank of America and things like this. And whereas they may not be slowing or stopping their personal credit lines, I guarantee you they're gonna be less apt or less inclined to uh, take on more lines of credit. They, so I think you're gonna see these shockwaves and quite frankly, there's nothing more deflationary than less available credit, okay? So that I think is where we're gonna start seeing. I honestly uh, believe that the time clock has started now uh, to, to what we're about to see is the inevitable uh, deflationary event of a, a credit bubble popping. Well, that, that raises a point. So through, I would, I, would also, I would normally agree with you that a credit bubble popping would be a deflationary event. There's less, uh, there's less credit in the system, which equals less money, which equals lo lower velocity. Um, but one take I saw recently online earlier today is that the banks might be preparing for a higher level of inflation by reducing their debt exposure. Because uh, when banks have a lot of debt, a lot of assets on their books of, of loans outstanding, um, they're concerned that they're being inflated away by higher inflation. Would, it, could that be part of this, that banks are getting a defensive posture because they see higher inflation in the system? Can I answer that too? Sure. Is that okay with you guys? Yeah, just right. speculating. So, so I, I believe that you, so I have an actual theory I was going to write up and try and publish, but I'll, I'll let you guys know tonight. Um, banks have been known to push the Fed into a, a corner. And it sounds funny because uh, there's a lot of posturing that always goes on where people go, ooh, it's the Fed against the banks. And people don't realize 
that the Fed is a bank. It's privately owned by the biggest banks. And so this is usually jawboning and posturing. And one thing is for certain, and this happened also back in 2007, banks con contracted the amount that they wanted to loan and they pushed the Fed into a decision where uh, more easy money flowed into the system. I believe that we're going to see that. And my theory, and it sounds funny, I'm going to I'm going to call it, you know, we've talked, we've heard about the dollar milkshake theory. We're going to talk about the economic ninjas dollar whip it theory. And essentially <laughs> yeah. what I see is uh, where we are is right now we're seeing inflation. We're about to see, uh, you know, during inflation, we see uh, spending slow down because people are needing to spend their hard earned dollars per month instead of on uh, luxury items, vacations and uh, and uh, PlayStations, they're now spending on, on higher priced food, fuel, and uh, real estate. Then what that happens is it causes deflation and credit freezing up, okay? Because we're seeing a lot more uh, banks are becoming well aware that uh, the monthly balance sheet of the average American, or quite frankly, this is gonna be, I believe worldwide, um, it's gonna uh, get tighter and, and can, you know, job, job openings are gonna get, uh, uh, less and less. It sounds funny, but um, Amazon and large companies right now are figuring out great ways to use AI to do uh, human beings jobs. Uh, so we're going to see credit freezing up, which causes deflation. And then what happens is, you know, like Ben Bernanke so famously put it, um, uh, we, we can guarantee deal with deflation because we can uh, essentially throw money, I'm paraphrasing, throw money at the people at the problem. And what I believe that's going to cause is hyperinflation. And I believe, uh, yes, it will be transitory, um, but that hyperinflation will essentially in America cause very real heavy inflation because we still are the dollar reserve currency, you know, the world reserve currency. Well, you know, that, that raises the point of how quickly if, if things do start tightening up because of actions like this by Wells Fargo or let's say JP Morgan or uh, Bank of America or the other big banks, if they start not approving all these new lines of credits that I assume all the Wells Fargo customers are going to start applying elsewhere to uh, reestablish their credit elsewhere. Wouldn't that sort of push the Fed into immediately, you know, you know, how, how I don't think we're going to get deeply into a disinflationary event because the Fed will respond so quickly to avoid that. <laughs> okay, Travis, you're taking over. All right. So first off, David needs to answer this question. So here's the question. David, have you ever seen the Fed act really fast when something happens? <laughs> yeah. Now, I want to ask, and I think you're, the ninja's going to answer, but Eddie, but it's an open forum, obviously. You know, if you go back to the 30s, a lot of those loans and mortgages were callable loans. And this is basically a call loan because on a personal line or signature line, you've got a $5,000 credit uh, line, for example, and now you don't. And you're going to get this notice, what, 30, 60 days that, uh, hey, guess what? You got a personal loan line of credit. You don't have it anymore. So now you're going to go out and scramble another bank to get that 5000 to pay off Wells Fargo, right? I think if the article is correct, people only have to make the minimum payments on the Wells Fargo. Oh, you're right. Thank, thank you. Thank so you. Thank you. you can, I just wanted to point out yeah. that, you know, that the rug was pulled out from under them in the 30s. And the banks have a lot of power, as we all know, and it just concerned me. So you know, <coughs> hey, I could stand corrected. I'm glad you pointed it out, Jim. But, uh, you know, those are the kind of things that I think about and that really scare me because mm -hmm. a lot of people are doing everything right by the book. They have equity in their homes. They, you know, saved and all that stuff. And all of a sudden, you know, they've lost their job due to the illness and they've got this credit line that they're using very effectively, efficiently for needed things. And all of a sudden it's called. And yeah. thank you for pointing out it. Is yeah, well, they, people lose a lot of flexibility very quickly. Travis? Yeah, so let me uh, clear this up. So, so these loans are not going to be uh, called due um, because uh, it, it would still have to, the banks have still have to uh, abide by the original contract, right? And in that original uh, contract lending agreement, uh, it gives you very specific reasons in which a bank can call loan due. This does not hit it. What they're simply doing is they're going to, um, freeze the credit line. So whatever you have uh, on it, and to give you an idea of the scope, I personally know people that have uh, personal credit uh, lines right now, Wells Fargo between twenty-five dollars and $50,000. So if I know a couple of people with these amounts, then I guarantee you there's even higher amounts. Um, so 
just like the story I gave in my video, uh, the, uh, both me and the person I was eating lunch with had a, ironically had the exact same HELOC amount back then, which is totally different, but similar uh, of a hundred thousand dollars. I ran down, wrote a check for a hundred grand out of the HELOC, put it into another account. And then what happened is when they froze it, um, the person across from me just lost their ability to get their hundred thousand dollars, which technically isn't theirs. It's just, you know, a promise for a loan. But with me, um, I was now locked into a hundred thousand dollar loan and it fell into those normal parameters of those loan documents. Okay. So just want to clear that up. Um, mm -hmm. but, but again, it's really the psychology of the banks right now and what they're doing to tighten, uh, these lending standards. You know, we should talk about this with, in relationship to the fed, because, one of the things that the Fed has been challenged by is the banks haven't been lending. So there's been no velocity of money. And now we have this. And Wells Fargo is just absolutely a huge monster bank. So I can only imagine what this is going to do to the money supply. You guys have any thoughts on that? Yeah. So let's start with the, uh, the velocity of money and the Fed. The facts are banks are scared to lend to the American public. We know it's a fact now because they are choosing to take money instead of putting it out in HELOCs, personal lines of credit, home mortgages, car loans. They are choosing to, and, and at, at those rates, they're making between three and let's say, geez, oh, seven, eight percent, right? They could even uh, put it into credit card debt, making 10, 12, 18 percent. They are choosing to put it on loan through the Fed. Well, with the Fed through their repo facility. And I believe right now it's paying point five of it's half of one percent. So that should show you the banks are that concerned with the ability for the American public going forward in the future to pay their debts. Now that alone or that um, amount is I believe past 1.4 trillion now and it keeps growing. Quite frankly, I believe we'll see two trillion within the next seven days. What's interesting about this, and I've been talking about this for six months on my show, is that I believe what's going to happen is the Fed is going, this is crazy because it can literally go either way. If we have a bond uh, shakeup, rates can jump up when people demand more money and the Fed, Fed would have to backstop that and you know, uh, you know, make it good to bring, bring those rates down. Or the Fed could choose, let's go negative. Let's uh, essentially penalize the banks for putting money on with the repo. However, it sounds funny because they're the ones that institute that half a percent, right? So you got to say, Rick Rule said in an interview we did uh, last week that it's essentially an arrow in the quiver because they're trying to do something, but there's not a lot of arrows in that quiver now. If we go negative, then if they go, let's say a negative Fed funds rate of 1%, now the banks are going, oh man, we better loan it into the economy, get the velocity moving faster. And then yes, we will see mortgage rates at about 1.5%. And if you thought the housing market was crazy now, you're going to get into a, a ludicrous mode. Let's just uh, use the term from Spaceballs. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's, it's pretty interesting. Any, any, any ideas on how this will affect precious metals, silver and gold, Mr. Morgan? Well, I think it's only another fundamental factor that's going to increase their value. Uh, whether it'll initially do it or not, I don't know. But what I do know is longer term, if you can't trust, you know, a credit line anymore, then uh, what can you trust? And, you know, the whole system is based on leverage. There's too much leverage. This is a huge deleveraging move. Uh, and I think uh, Traps did a great job explaining, you know, the repercussions or potential repercussions. Some people that have savings that are now scared to take action will move into the precious metals. I can almost guarantee it. So longer term, uh, I think there's going to be a run to gold at some point that's unstoppable. I really believe that. Uh, in fact, if you look at what the banks have done over the last decade, on net, central banks have been net buyers of gold over the last <clears throat> decade. And if you look over the World Gold Council's most recent data, there's been an increase in, I think it was seven or eight nations that have increased their gold by 43%. And I was asked why such a large number. And my answer is very simple because they know what's coming. This is probably a tip off because they're usually ahead of the game. They're buying gold. You should yeah. do the same thing. I saw the, the Russians are, and uh, Indonesia, uh, all these countries are just dramatically increasing purchases lately. You know, I, I think you guys are right. This is initially 
might be a negative for silver and gold and because people might interpret this as a disinflationary event, uh, you know, reduction in money supply, uh, reduction in velocity. But then I think the reaction of Congress is probably going to be more stimmy checks, um, massive, more bailouts, more support for people who don't have enough income to get through this. <coughs> Excuse me. And probably, uh, yeah, a lot more uh, Fed monetization of uh, of the debt. That's what I you think is going to happen. This is a, a step toward universal basic income. You're reading my mind, Lee, because I was going to throw that out to the forum. Is this just one more step? I put I was going to put on my tinfoil hat and ask the same question. To me, I think it is. I think it's just one more, you know, tool in the toolbox to get everybody used to the idea that the economy is so bad and you all deserve it. And, you know, these stimulus checks are no longer stimulus mm -hmm. checks. They're just your UBI and you deserve it. And here it comes. Look at your mailbox on the 30th of every month. That's my guess. Let me let me throw something in there. So I believe that the goal is to keep you just uh, just poor enough, but also uh, make you feel just rich enough to uh, not care, right? And uh, I believe that actually you're done seeing the uh, the stimulus until we see a large downturn in the market. The reason why is because it would force too many people right now because too many people have enough money to pay their bills. And, and I know there's some people out there that are really struggling, don't get me wrong. But by and large, there are a lot of people working that are taking this stimulus check and pushing it into assets. And a lot of them we have seen recently buy physical gold and silver. The facts are, if they keep doing this, then people are going to continually buy the physical, pull it off the market. It is literally happening before our eyes. It's, it's like a blessing I mean, to be able to watch this in real time is just uh, incredible to me. But I believe that what's going to happen is there will be a big downturn in uh, equities. And again, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm more of a weird wizard. But my point being is that uh, that is what we need. Some, uh, the Fed needs something to uh, and, and Congress needs something to happen so that people will be begging them to do something. You see, nobody wants to do anything uh, preactive. You always want to be, if you're a leader, it sounds bad, a bad leader, reactive, because you can always sort of go, well, it wasn't my fault. It's, you know, just a guarantee, just like the MBS mortgage backed security saying, well, you guys were the ones that signed the loans. It's yeah. not like, you know, hey, come on. We knew what you guys were doing. This was predatory lending. David, I'm curious what your thoughts are. Say we do go into some sort of deflationary spiral because, you know, the velocity in that money just completely collapses. The money supply completely collapses. What happens to precious metals? Well, I think the safest answer is I don't know. But, you know, really, the, one of the best books written on gold is The Golden Concert by Roy Jastrom. And he shows throughout history that gold actually does better in a deflation. I've been saying what Doug Casey said for years and years. I look at gold not as an inflation or a deflation hedge. I look at it as a crisis hedge. I think that's the most pertinent term during the current situations that we all face globally. Gold could sell off in dollar terms, but I don't think it'd be very much. Silver, on the other hand, is perceived to be you know, an industrial metal only, which it's not. It is a monetary metal as well. And I think it'd get a bigger hit, but I think it'd recover the fastest, especially when the Fed does what we all believe it'll do, or the central banks at large, and that is to try to inflate their way out of it. And that's the time when you really want to be in the precious metals, particularly silver. That's my take. Well, guys, um, I want to thank you for getting together so quickly at the last minute to talk about this subject. I know it's on, on a lot of people's minds. I've seen it all over Twitter people commenting on it. And uh, thank you, Mr. Ninja. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having us.